Welcome. Um, I know that many of you may be um, getting a little bit anxious about the changes that are going to be implemented soon, so hopefully this will allay some of your fears. Uh, I actually wrote the comparing section of the text and I've worked extensively on that section outside of um, writing the text itself. So I can give you um, a few insights into the kinds of things that you might expect um, as we change over to that new study over the next couple of years. So um, I'll go through the whole, uh, the whole s study with you now, but I think it might be worth asking if you have any questions along the way, if you'd like to write them down, and then when we get to the end, if I haven't yet answered them, then um, feel free to ask them. Otherwise, if I stop, I think we'll, we'll go for too long. So we'll just see how we go. Okay, so today we're going to have a look at um, the structure of the new course and we're particularly going to look at the new areas of study and the assessment tasks that have been allocated. So we'll be looking at um, the reading and creating area, um, which we all know as reading and responding, um, um, the analytical response, the creative response, which is not necessarily new if you've been around for a while, but it might be new for some of you. Um, the comparing task, analysing argument and language and presenting argument. And um, I can talk about the EAL differences if um, anyone out there is specifically needs that information. Um, but we'll, we'll go from there. Yep, okay. So what we know now is that uh, from next year, we're going to have a staged implementation of this new study design. Um, so next year we'll have units one and two being implemented and then the year after will be units three and four. Uh, and I know that some schools this year have already started implementing changes to their year 10 curriculum uh, to prepare their students. And I'm just wondering if you could just give me an idea of how many of you are considering or have already decided to change year 10 this year, just to get an idea. Okay, thank you, so many of you. So hopefully I'll be able to give you some ideas about what to do there. So at a glance, the rationale really for this new study design is not that different from um, the current study design. Uh, you'll note that I'll call it the current and the new. I don't wanna say new and old because it gets a bit confusing. But really the focus uh, for the new study really focuses in and hones in on the nature of the texts that we study. So the texts are much more um, explicitly part of the course and because of the replacement of the context, um, you'll be pleased to know, I hope, that the use of the text will be much more explicit for the students. So there won't be any of that, um, that uncertainty about how much I use the text or how much the students can use it they will have to use it in the comparing part. So you'll notice that it, this is all about engagement with texts and about the range of texts that students will be expected to, to experience across the curriculum. So there'll be, um, there is a focus there on the contemporary, on the past, and it's about making our students become critically aware communicators and it, I guess the other shift is we've moved to this recognition of the global community. So even with um, the presenting argument and the persuasive language section, the issue that students can study can now be global. So it's much more open than our former study design. So in keeping in step with the changes and the developments in technology. So at a glance, what has happened is we no longer have three areas of study and in many ways having three areas of study was so much easier to explain and, and was so much help, more helpful for students. But we now only have two areas of study. So our areas of study really have been um, collapsed. So area of study one and area of study two have become one and area of study two stands on its own. So we have, um, I guess you'll see the, the sequencing and the repetition moving across from Unit 1 to Unit 4. And there will be a gradual and staged 
development of the skills that are required um, of students and slightly different tasks as they move through units one, two, three and four. And you'll note there is a shift in unit four where our um, analysing and presenting argument appears again, whereas in this current study we do all of our issues in unit three and then we have to somehow build in some revision time for students when we get to the end because we don't revisit it um, in the study design. Whereas the way that the course is now structured allows you to revisit that through the oral presentation. So that's something just to keep in mind. So looking at the uh, reading and creating area of study one, I thought it was important just to look at the emphases. If I had done um, this with the former study design, the emphasis would be quite different. So the current study design certainly does not have the focus on text that this study design has. So you'll notice that text there is very prominent. And for some, that will be probably a little disappointing because I guess those students who struggle with literacy, it's more text for them to work with. Others will be happy about it because it gives students something much more concrete to work with than what was there before with the, the contexts. So you'll notice that text is central. It's about meaning, it's about interpretation, and it's also about the features of texts. So the construction of the text and how the construction of the text contributes to the meaning. So there is still that emphasis on um, the way the text is constructed. There's still emphasis on the elements of text that we would ordinarily teach our students, but there is an increased um, focus on the features and we'll talk about that more in a moment. So what does reading and creating involve? It's a single text, so as it, as it stands now, you study the text um, on its own. But the key things to note that we need to uh, really tease out with our students are an understanding of the ways in which authors construct meaning. So it's about the construction of meaning. A focus on the features of texts, such as the structure, the conventions and the language. So I would say to you, it's very much about how the form of the text, so whether it's a novel, whether it's a film, whether it's a play, how those particular conventions uh, impact on the, on the meaning of the text. So it's a deconstruction not just of character, but it's of the way the text has been constructed. And I think that is a much greater emphasis than has been there before. Um, there's also um, the usual stuff that you would expect, which would be an exploration of the, understand, of the underlying concepts that are presented. And I think there's a much more explicit um, acknowledgement that students need to develop their own interpretation. And I know with my experience with students, that's something they find really difficult, owning their own reading, owning their own interpretation of a text. Often what they are more comfortable doing is asking you to tell them, well, what this text is about. Um, and so I think that's a real development um, that needs to be considered. So in reading and creating, um, I thought it would be important just to show you the difference in the two units. So in unit one, when you're looking at how authors create meaning, you're looking really at the world of the text. So it's all of those contextual um, elements. So we're talking about um, the historical setting, the social setting, the cultural setting, all of those things. We're looking at um, how authors use the features, um, such as the conventions, the structures and the language to create meaning and also, um, how do they use their context, their purpose and their audience to influence a text? Nothing that's greatly different there, but if you then have a look to how we move across to unit three, there is a shift and the shift moves towards that idea of the values in texts. So 
it's very much more explicit about what are the explicit and implied values that underpin the text. So they're the values that are presented by the author as a consequence of the context in which the text has been set. And then taking that um, idea of the features one step further, how do the features then influence the interpretation? So I think this is where text selection is going to become really important because you need to think about the kinds of texts that your students would be uh, able to, um, to deconstruct in that way. Um, and then, um, in what ways can different interpretations of texts invite readers to react or to develop their own position, to, to react to or to develop their own position? So, it's about how um, the different ways we read um, impacts on the kinds of positions that we take. So, it's quite sophisticated. So, as a result, the reading and creating um, section um, in Unit 3 has, as I said, been collapsed and pulled together. So there are two assessment tasks that need to be completed for this part of the course. Uh, so the first one is an analytical interpretation of a selected text in written form and a creative response to a selected text in written or oral form with a written explanation of decisions made in the writing process and how these demonstrate understanding of the text. Now this is where I would jump in and say to you, this is um, where I would pick up the opportunity to um, address one of these areas in my Year 10 course. I know that you um, at this stage of the year can't ask your students to purchase another text so that you can create a pair. Some of you will be thinking, I would like to do comparison at Year 10. Um, that's not the only new part of the course. This is new, the creative response. So I would suggest that you consider for Year 10, perhaps adapting one of your assessment tasks that you already have, instead of getting the students to write a straight text response as you ordinarily would, but to turn that into an opportunity to write their own um, creative response. So the creative response, um, I'll go into more detail in a moment, but that notion of um, writing um, from a different character's point of view, writing a prologue, um, writing a chapter that can be inserted into the text, uh, that could be where you fit in um, some of that new stuff for your Year 10s this year so that it's not just cold when they go up into Year 11. Um, the written explanation of decisions in there, we'll talk more about. I know that's the thing we all love because that's the thing the students can't do very well. Um, the written explanation, because there's also another um, statement of intention that comes, which is actually different, asking different things, okay? So that's something you need to keep in mind. And then for the EAL students, um, they have an analytical interpretation of a selected text in written form which is the same, and they have um, the choice, however, of doing the creative response. So they do one or the other. You will note in the mainstream English there that the students um, have to do both sections. So, so keep, keep that in mind, but also note that with the creative response, they can do it in oral form. Uh, so it will be up to you to make that decision. Um, thinking about whether or not the students get enough opportunity to write and if you make that an oral presentation, what does that mean for their um, experience of writing? But then on the other hand, the oral presentation might be a better fit for some of your students um, and give them um, a greater opportunity to get in, um, a better in-depth understanding of the text. So something to consider. So just noting there, it's interpretation. So it's not just a response to the text, but it's showing a reading. Um, and then having to do both and noting there the difference. And as I've just pointed out. So to note that the creative response may be completed as an oral or a written. And it must include a written explanation of decisions that will be assessed 
globally as part of the SAC and will appear on the assessment rubric. So the rubrics have been put together at the minute um, and some of the, and the rubric will have in their mention of the explanation of decisions, but it will be part of the whole um, thing. It won't be separated out. So it's important that you know that it doesn't have to be a great lengthy um, piece of writing. Um, so some of the ideas for it are um, they can present the original text from an alternative perspective. They can transpose the original text into another form. They can explore a gap or a silence in the original text, or they can create a new key moment or aspect of the original text. And I think one of the things that has been difficult in the past with this kind of response is the credibility and authenticity of the response. So some students trying to transpose their text into some really quite um, unsuitable setting, for example, or projecting something into a futuristic kind of thing that wouldn't work with the original intention. So it's about keeping the students um, uh, real, keeping them real with what they have to do. So I guess keeping them a bit reined in and making sure that their responses are appropriate in so far as that text is concerned. So some more complex ideas would be to adapt a language feature or a stylistic device of the text into a new context or explore a key idea of the text in a different setting. Um, but I think you can, you can come um, to that in your own way and make that suit your students. So some ideas could be a monologue, a stage direction for a script, a short story, a graphic text, a prologue. They're just some ideas. So, written explanation, that is, what, that is the length of the written explanation that is expected. This has been written um, in keeping with the descriptors and the things that are in the study design. And so, um, for my creative response, I decided to write an internal monologue for the character of Julia in the novel 1984. This seemed appropriate given that the text presents the point of view of Winston and I thought it would be interesting to view the narrative from the perspective of Julia. The choice of this form allowed me to draw on a number of the key concepts in the novel such as surveillance, control and the loss of memories from the past. I explored the thoughts that Julia might have had just before the thought police stormed the antique shop. I chose a first person narrative to mirror the conventions employed by Orwell in the original text. I focused on this moment because it is pivotal to the novel and it allowed me to compare Julia's naivety and carelessness about her actions with Winston's serious concerns about his future. Now, it doesn't have to be any more detailed than that. I have in the past seen some of these written explanations longer than the actual piece itself. So keep in mind, it, just, it has to be a decent paragraph, but that's all. It doesn't have to be pages and pages, and it just has to focus on, as I said, the form, um, the reason for, for doing what they're doing, and um, noting how their, um, their interpretation will change the, the original. So that's just to give you a guide. So if we then look at the other part of area study one, which is the one you're all interested in, reading and comparing, you'll notice that, again, text is central to that. Um, comparing, but we're comparing in this instance, ideas, issues and themes. And if you're like me, you're going to say, what is the difference between an idea, an issue and a theme? It's a good thought if you're having it, because when you actually try to isolate those things, it's hard to do. But can I just say, for example, surveillance is an idea in 1984, but um, a theme is more um, the way that um, surveillance impacts on the characters. So it's that thread. So we're looking at the key things that recur in the text. So, reading and comparing, what does this involve? Now, um, I have written this section of the book, the textbook, um, with my colleague. Um, between us, we have experience in the writing of the study design and the writing of the advice to teachers document. So, we've got background, but I need to add and emphasise to you, 
we don't know what the exam is going to look like and we still don't know. So we were writing in a vacuum. Uh, we were trying to get uh, sample topics, but we, we never quite succeeded. So I know where and what is expected in, um, in the actual study, but I can only give you um, my guesses as to the kinds of things that might be asked in the exam, and I'll tell you that as we get there. So this requires a study of a pair of texts. Now, VCAR will have a list and it will have the pairs of text set for you. You will just need to pick the pair that suits your students. The pairs will not have broad themes or names and on top of them. So it won't be they're paired and it says family or war or whatever. You're only going to get pairs of text listed. Hopefully the pairs um, will have glaringly obvious ideas, themes and issues that they have in common that will jump out at you and you'll say, I can see why they, are, they have been paired. That is our hope. You will probably, this is just all probably, you, there will probably be around eight pairs to choose from. Each of the pairs will um, contain two texts they could be two texts of the same form, so you could have two novels, but it will generally be a mixture of forms. So it could be a film and a novel, it could be a film and a play, it could be a novel and a play, it could be uh, non-fiction and a novel. All right? um, I, may I also suggest to you that there will most probably not be any collections in the pairs. And when I say collections, collections of short stories or collections of poetry. Reason being, if you take your head there, very hard to get a thread. Um, so when you're selecting for year 10 and year 11, I would suggest that you don't go to collections. I suggest you go to, to um, substantive texts that have something that connects them. So we're focusing on ideas, issues and themes, but we haven't left that idea of the textual features. We haven't left that idea of the structures, conventions and language. That's, that comes into it. So you've looked at it with your single text. It comes into the comparison. And um, they have to write a comparison. And the hope is that the comparison will provide them with an enriched understanding of both texts. That's what, they, that's what the hope is. So... The specifications for the pairs, they do not need to be the same form. They can include um, one multimodal text, such as a film or a graphic novel. And I'll just state it here. If you do a multimodal text in text list one, so if you're studying a film in text list one, you can't do a multimodal in the pairs. So you need to be really clear about the text that you would like to do. They won't necessarily have poetry and short stories and um, and it will not be and it can't be a comparison of the same title in two different forms. So it's not about adaptations and transformations if you teach literature. It is not about the novel and the film version. That, that is not what this um, study is concerned with. Now, these are sample text pairings that I have constructed. This is not a VCAR list. But I can tell you that the pair the pairs that will be listed will contain texts that are very familiar to you. There will be texts that are familiar and then there will be some new ones. Um, I tried to illustrate with those pairs the smackingly obvious things that you might compare. That is what um, the pairs should look like on the VCAR list. That you should be able to look at them and go, oh, yep, I can see. I can see the connection. So they are also there for you as suggestions for year 11 and suggestions for year 10 because uh, when we were writing this book we were writing for an audience of year 10, year 11 and year 12. So there are some complex texts there, there are some less complex ones, you might be thinking well why is To Kill a Mockingbird, we all know that goes into year 10 and year 9, that's because we were writing for year 10. So 12 Angry Men, an extraordinarily popular play for EAL students particularly, um, Girl with a Pearl Earring and Jane Eyre, um, The Crucible and Year of Wonders, 
um, night and the complete mouse. There's your multimodal text. You've got your graphic novel, but you've also then got your memoir. Um, My Brother Jack, a very substantial novel with a film on the waterfront. And then um, 1984 and Stasiland. Um, I came up with that pair. That pair isn't going to be on the list. <laughs> But the reason being, Stasiland's coming off text list one and we, it's, it's going to get confusing if we move them across. But if you look at those, I hope that you, you're sitting there going, yeah, I can see. I can see what my kids could do with this. So you're not going to, it's not going to be stipulated to you, these are the things to look for. You are going to be able to work with the text in your own way, but there should be um, core elements that you can see that you could compare. Um, and it's about comparing similarities and it also is about identifying differences, okay? The other thing is, um, my work has shown me that this study design is much more flexible than I ever imagined. <coughs> I hadn't thought about it, this, but I'll just state to you, nowhere does it say that they have to write about both texts in an equal amount. Just remember that. They don't have to write 50% of this text, 50% of that text. They may only compare the similarities if they like. It doesn't, it's not compare and contrast, remember that as well. So if you've got kids who struggle and you can simplify it, do, do that because I think that's, that's what we're here for. We can tailor our assessment task to our students and if you can take that opportunity and take the weight off for some of those students who struggle, get them to look at the things that are similar or get them to look at the glaring differences, if you, if you like. But it doesn't say they have to be equally compared. It doesn't say anything about contrasting. It says similarities and or differences. Okay, so my first port of call with this is, have a look at what connections are made first. That's the first thing. So the reading and comparing, if you move from units two to four, Firstly, in, in Unit 2, it's about how the authors convey the ideas, issues and themes. But you can see that word connections. It's about how, in Unit 4, the connections can be made and what then they, they make of these connections, how that then um, enriches their understanding of the text and allows them to build um, a reading. Um, note in Unit 2, it's about the similarities and or differences, as I just said, but in Unit 4, it's about the interplay. It's about also about how the form changes or influences the ideas, issues and themes. So I'll give you an example. If they're talking about mouse and they're using, uh, they're describing the graphic, they can say through um, the frame that illustrates this, the power of fear is demonstrated, blah, blah. Fear, however, um, as represented in night, is done in this way, and, this is, and talking about the form in the first person memoir. Okay, so you're bringing in the layers of what they've done. They've talked about features, you bring in that, but you also talk about ideas, issues, and themes. Um, and then finally, um, we're looking at enriched meaning, but then we're also looking at um, how looking at the two texts gives them a different perspective on the ideas, issues and themes. Does it actually place them in a different position once they've read them both? So in um, the outcome, which is Unit 4, um, note that there is a shift from a comparison of the presentation. So in um, Unit 2, they're looking at the presentation, so how they're presented. And it becomes a detailed analysis in year 12, in three, four, in four. Okay, so it's about presentation of ideas, issues and themes in unit two, and then it's about an analysis of the, the two texts. So um, note that the unit four assessment task is a detailed comparison in written form of how two selected texts present ideas, issues and themes. This does have impact on your planning because it means that it would make sense to study your texts side by side, whereas at the moment you can split your context texts. So it is going to affect your timeline and your planning. You'll note that they only get one opportunity to write the comparison as in assessment task. So they've got two pieces for their single study and one piece 
for their comparative study. Um, and I won't read that out to you, but that's just a sample um, comparison. Now, throughout the textbook, um, in the reading and comparing section, we have written comparisons. So there's samples in there, and the samples use the pairs that I listed before. Um, so if you were planning for year 10 and year 11, you can just take, take some ideas from those texts, but you can use these as samples as well. These samples have all been written with the knowledge and skills next to them, and they've all been verified across. So this is the kind of thing that they're looking for. Um, this is, of course, a sophisticated one. It's an integrated comparison. Remember, too, there's nothing that says they have to be talking about two, two of the books in the same paragraph. You could have one book, one paragraph, one text the next. So this, of course, is the more complex, but there are different ways of being able to do it. So, analysing and presenting um, the new emphases, um, I'm, I'm sort of, I'll go through this and then I can come back and we can talk more. I thought it would be more helpful. Um, with the new emphases for the um, analysing and presenting argument, really, um, you can see there, the big word is argument. And the reason that argument has been um, explicitly outlined and targeted is because of this tendency we've had with students to essentially do a language analysis that consists of a list of persuasive devices without any connection back to the argument. So this is, um, has been built in to, in the hope that students and teachers will now focus not only on how the text is written, but what the text is writing about, what is in there. So the overall argument of the piece, but also the supporting arguments. So the contention and the supporting arguments. Now, some of us out there will be thinking, well, that's what I always did. And that's what I said. I said, and what's the difference? Um, and my answer, I was shouted down with, but you taught it properly. Oh, thank you. That's good. So, but what's happened is the focus on argument means there's a bit of a shift. And what you need to note is they've split units three and unit four. So that's something we're not used to. Everything before has been all in one unit. So I'll show it to you now. Um, so it's a, there is a similar focus to the current study design, but it is different enough to warrant much more breaking down of um, what is expected. So there's a shift away from just the analysis of the language, um, but now the students are required to look at the construction of the argument. Um, and what's really important now is, I mean, I think we're probably, we've evolved as technology has developed, but the t media text or the text can come from a range of sources. They can be print, they can be digital, they, um, they can be, um, the issue could be domestic, state, national or international. So it doesn't have to be something that's occurred on their doorstep. And so what that, as I said to you earlier, the global, it's opening up um, the opportunity to explore global um, issues with the students. And I think what you really need to note is that the graduated building towards what's expected. So in unit one, it's about how argument and persuasive language can be used to position audiences. In unit two, it's about how argument and persuasive language um, influence an audience, but also how do these texts present a point of view and then we move up and we're looking more at the quality of the argument. And I think that's something just to note. Um, we're not, now, we're not evaluating the argument and that's important. But we're noting whether, uh, how reason and logic have been used. We're noting um, the impact on an audience um, when similarities and differences between the media texts are considered. Can I just add in there? 
The SAC for this, um, for Unit 3, requires the students to compare. This was built in to the study as an attempt to allow students more opportunity to practice comparison. However, the exam will not require them to compare. Okay? So, think about how you might set that SAC up so that it doesn't give you a headache and your students a headache. Um, it requires them to look at text and to look at it, but it's not asking them to do um, the same kind of thing in as much detail as the comparison of the two texts. So just note, it's there for the SAC, but it won't be in the exam. Um, and so how do language and argument complement one another? And I think that's quite new and different. Okay, something to think about. And then um, unit four, which is actually relating to the presentation of a point of view, is um, how do authors construct arguments that present a sustained and reasoned point of view. So, um, as you can see, if you look across, uh, we have, um, looking at area of study two just for the minute, you'll see that um, in Unit 1 and Unit 2, they're called the same thing, analysing and presenting argument, but then when it comes across to Unit 3 and 4, they're split. So in Unit 3, it's analysing argument, which is written, but in Unit 4, it's um, presenting argument, which is the oral. Okay? And you might be thinking to yourself, okay, we do Unit 3 earlier in the year and then we come back to the oral, do they need to be doing their oral on the same issue? No, nothing says that. There's nothing that says they have to be the same. So you can do something completely different. You can get the students, students to choose their own. It's up to you, but there's no mandate that says you have to use the same material or anything like that. Um, the EAL people will note um, that you now have a listening task and that is the big difference for you guys. Um, and that listening task is in there um, as a way of modifying um, what the students had to do with um, analysing and presenting argument. Um, and we'll talk about that more in a second. So, I'm always ahead of myself. Okay, so analysing, presenting argument, um, unit three and unit four. So, as I said to you, note that in um, unit three, they have to analyse and compare and they have to use um, they're look, so they're looking at argument and persuasive language in, um, in two to three texts that present a point of view and the texts need to come from the 1st of September as I always have. And then in outcome two for unit four, this is now note it's a statement of intention as opposed to a written explanation that we saw before. Um, the statement of intention is something um, that they all need to do it has to be an oral. They don't have the option here. Um, and they need to articulate their intention about the decisions they make. And this needs to show how they understand the argument and the persuasive language that they're going to be um, using. Um, and so what they're then going to do is to present their own point of view. It must be an oral form and it needs to model what they've been studying and present a sound argument and persuasive language. Um, and note, it doesn't have to be the same issue. So, things to note. The inclusion of the comparison of media texts in Unit 3 is to provide students with more practice at comparative writing. That students need to analyse the arguments presented in the text, not just the persuasive language. And so I think that means you really need to be looking for accessible um, texts that students can uh, really engage with in order to be able to tease out the arguments. Um, and that the point of view must be an oral and has been moved to Unit 4 to keep students thinking about their media texts for the whole year. Um, and hopefully, hopefully that allows you the opportunity to, to keep that in their minds so that it's not forgotten and has to be picked up completely. Um, and note that there is a focus on the quality of argument in Unit 4. Okay, so 
Note that the statement of intention for the oral will be marked separately from the presentation. Now that's different to what I just said to you before about the other piece which was marked globally and I'm pointing this out to you so that you realise the other one's built in but this one is separate. Um, and that's different to the explanation um, of decisions for area study one. And this is the result of feedback from teachers who wanted students to have more experience with written analytical work in preparation for the exam. So we got um, all information from teachers, they collated it all and it was deemed appropriate to include this so that the students are thinking about why they're doing particular things and hopefully that then can translate across to looking at these techniques in, um, in the articles that they receive. So note that that's separate. Um, okay, I'll go back. So we've got the comparison um, in Unit 3 and in Unit 4, the oral, okay, and, and the piece of writing. So note that the um, statement of intention is worth 10 marks and the oral itself is 30, so it's split off and that the other one is worth 40. Uh, and then with EAL, uh, the students uh, have to analyse and compare the use of argument and persuasive language um, and show a demonstration of an understanding of two to three texts that present a point of view and that the short answer responses are still there and the notes sum form summaries. Um, and the analysis and comparison of argument and the use of persuasive language in the same two to three texts in written form. And then EAL have to do um, very similar things. They have to do their written statement of intention and their point of view, so not much difference. So, um, in summary, it's, this study design is similar enough for comfort. Um, we know essentially what we're doing, but it's different enough to be exciting. I think people are relieved that context is gone, most people are because they found it quite frustrating because it was so vague and the goalposts kept moving on us and we never really knew what was expected. Um, and unfortunately, it turned into another text response, let's be honest. Um, and expository form took over and many schools were not even allowing their students to look at persuasive or creative responses, imaginative responses. Um, it addresses some problems in the previous study design, the main, the main thing being context and also, I mean, the contexts haven't changed since they were first introduced and it's becoming increasingly difficult to come up with new prompts, how to say the same thing in different ways for over the last however many years. It needed to be refreshed um, and people really felt uncomfortable with it. Um, the key knowledge and key skills are still the key. So when you look at that study design, you look at those dot points, they're the things that are important. And I think what's really important is to keep in mind that it allows um, this study design, as with the previous ones, but more so, is much more flexible. Um, and you can have a look at it and as long as your students are covering things they need to cover in the exam, then um, you can tailor it more to, to meet the needs of your students. Um, and so I think that you can um, provide a more individualised approach. So I think it's actually really exciting. I think it will be um, taken up in a positive way by teachers. People are generally enthusiastic about it. Uh, of course, the comparison part is the one that most people are anxious about. But the comparison is fairly straightforward um, and I think that once you get into it and once we start to generate our own samples and things like that, it will make more sense. Um, so, does anyone have any questions? When are the yeah, at the moment, um, the text list for the pairs will be out um, by February next year. That's the usual date for, um, 
for the list. The study design has been released. The advice to teachers is coming out um, in term three this year. And then the text list will be the last thing. The reason being, it is an increasingly complex task to get those pairs right. Um, one thing I can um, also tell you is that if a text has been on the context list, so text list two, and it's only been on there for a year, there is a concerted effort being made to put that text into one of the pairs so that the work that you've done on that text isn't in vain. You, don't, you, know, you get more out of your resources. Um, know that there will be familiar texts in those pairs, um, but what we're trying to, to do is to give you something fresh that you can run with, but also know that there are things there that you're going to know as well. So it's not going to be all new. That's something to note. Any other questions? Ask. Yep. Um, just in terms of the EAL and new ministry yeah. listening to texts, yeah. and also not only about what that involves, mm. but is that a text additional to what the mainstream are doing? Um, yeah, the answer is um, no. The, the construction of that task is taking place at the moment. Okay. With EAL, the students will not have to do the comparison of two texts. Okay, so in the exam, the students can choose, you, essentially EAL teachers will take two texts from list one and one of the pairs, one text from the pairs and the students study three texts, not four. And the student, the EAL students may use any of those three texts to respond to the text in the exam. Does that make sense? It's not easy to <laughs> explain, it's a bit complicated. So the, um, the listening task does not involve increasing the number of texts that they're studying. It will be, it's, it's because I, it, I haven't seen the finished product, but it's similar to, um, at the moment, there are some, are there some low listening tasks? There, it's not dissimilar to a late listening task, but I don't want to lead you the wrong way with that. I know that there's a skeleton there. Um, so if I go back. Okay, so here, if you can see here, the AAL students do, um, an, um, they do one essay, um, one written response, or one creative response. They don't do both. So that's one less piece of writing. So then when they do their listening task, so that's their other task, that makes up for the fact that they're not doing two pieces, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, if, I, if I knew more, I'd tell you, but I don't. There, it's um, really about um, trying, to make it, trying to make it more accessible for EAL. I don't know whether that's going to work, but I but I, I really want to assure you that the text when the texts are chosen, EAL is at the forefront of the decisions that we make. But what does an EAL text look like? Um, and we work really hard to try to get representations of texts on there that are um, EAL friendly. Um, but this EAL will not have to do the com written comparison. Okay. Any other question? Yep. Um, you've seen that the text is on text list two. Yep. Uh, text list one, it will be just normal rotation of text. So at the moment, whatever number of years it is in the brackets will remain. So they will just rotate as usual. But with text list two, with the pairs, they'll of course all be starting with one, but we'll be we'll be trying to move across. So I'll give you an example. We'll be trying to put Invictus on there. We'll be trying to put, um, I read through them the other day, the, the other, there are three of them that are in their first year. We'll be trying to, to pair them up in some way. Um, and so of course Invictus is a film, so that already means if you're doing multimodal over here, you can't do it. It becomes quite complicated. So text list one will remain same four year rotation and won't change. Yep. There might be 
with Textlist One, there might be also an opportunity if a text is, uh, that's right, what the other thing we're trying to do too is if there are gaps on text list one and it hasn't been on long in text list two, we might move it over so that you've still got access to that text. So there is movement and it is trying to accommodate you guys. Um, any, anything else? Any other questions? Um, when are we likely to see an exam paper? And <laughs> are we looking at, say, three hours? Oh, yep, I can tell you that. Yep, yep, I can tell you that. Um, the exam hasn't been written. And anyone, anyone knows good curriculum planning. What should you have? You should have the end result and you work backwards. Well, hey, you know. The, the exam hasn't been written. Okay. But what you need to know is it is still a three-hour exam for English. Um, and there are still three sections. There will be the first section will be um, responding to the single text. The second section will be comparison. And the third section will be analysing argument and persuasive language. It won't look too different to what we've already got. Um, there will be a choice of questions as there is now. So there'll be two per text. And there will be a choice for comparison. What do those comparative questions look like? I don't know, but I'll tell you what I think they might look like. And that's in the book as well. We had to take lots of punts here and we did. So in the book, there are the samples. The, the, it will, we are assured that they'll be broad. So I'll give you, um, if you um, have a look at the book too, at the end of the um, session, you're going to receive the sample chapter, this reading and creating, reading, comparing. This is the section that I, that I wrote and it's got answers to many of your questions here that you're asking. So make sure you, you grab that. Um, two, two ways that they might look. The first way is compare the way these two texts discuss the idea of friendship. I made that up. Don't quote me. That's one way the question might look. The second way the question might look, and this is the one that we all shudder, compare these two texts by using the key quote from each. One key quote, the other key quote. I suggest you start working with those two forms, because I don't know the answer. I'm not holding out on you because I don't know the answer. But that's what's been mooted so far. So I would very... Um, what we're trying to get away from is prepared answers, predictions of what it's going to be, all of that stuff. But if you do that, then it leaves us not knowing either. So you sort of can't win. So there are some people that are really in favour of the two quotes, but that is a very complex task. It's asking something else. It's another thing. So I would be teaching close reading using a lot of textual um, material with my comparison, but I'd also be looking at big, broad things. <laughs> so it can be one or the other, and I don't know the answer. And they could floor me and write something completely different, but I, I can't imagine what they would do. Can I ask you about the structure of the EAM exam? Um, yeah, they're still working on that. <laughs> but the, what I know is the students will have to, they can choose from the three texts and they'll be writing a single text response. And um, they will be also doing analysis of persuasive language. And they're trying to work out at the minute how they build in the um, connection to the listening task and all that. So that bit's not finalised. So sorry, I can't tell you enough. But I can tell you they don't have to compare. That's all I can hold on to. Am I correct in the assumption that on the English exam there will be no opportunity for students to write imaginatively, creatively? Okay. There is... There is... There will be no provision for them to write a creative response in the exam? Yes. The creative response is only a SAC. You will have your straight text response, you will have your comparison and you will have your analysis. And in answer to your question, yes. This has become a textually based study and the 
Differences that have been built in have been built in to provide students with an opportunity to write in different ways. However, it is still based on the text. And for us as English teachers, that's a really hard thing because where do we get to experiment with different forms? All of those things. Um, and I say, we get to experiment with different forms through the study of the different forms of text in um, analysis and presentation. I, don't, I can never call that thing. I just, we know it's analysing persuasive language. But yeah, it, it is textually based. So you, you, know, you could consider the old creative as a legitimate option. Absolutely. For 12 students. Yep. Because the threat that would be a yep. creative written yep. is, you, is obsolete in a way. Yep. If, look, yes, you could. You, you, yeah, I mean, I guess the thing is, everything is written in a way that doesn't make it reductive so that it becomes just about the exam. But we all know the reality of our lives is that we have to, we don't have enough time and that we're preparing our students for an exam and, hey, we're the ones that have the data given to us. This is the graph. And, I, and so... <coughs> I think it's really important to be strategic about where you do your orals. However, having said that, in my experience of doing creative responses in the past, in English and in literature, has been those students who, either, who, who did it orally really did get to know their text in so much more depth and were able to write their responses in a much more sophisticated way. So that oral, I wouldn't write it off as, well, it's just an oral, we'll get it over with. It's actually quite valuable. The other, the other issue there is, do they get enough practice at writing? And if you feel like there's not enough opportunity for writing, then maybe the written is a better way. So I think you've got to look at it in terms of your students because it depends on, you know, what your policy is about how many times they can give you a draft and all of that stuff. I mean. Our main thing is burnout and we mark, that's all we do. So it's about trying to minimise that so that you can actually just hone in on what you need to do. But the long and the short of it is the kinds of writing we're used to are not there. Yep. I know that there's some design changes too, but do you think these changes alter the dynamic between the two subjects? Um, yeah, it, look, I was anticipating, I'm anti anticipating that. A lot of people have said it's turning into literature. Um, I would say it isn't in so far as the text forms that we've still got in English are the same. So um, we're not changing from, you know, in, in lit, it's still, um, still literarily based. Um, but I've, I actually got couple of answers. I wrote them down so that I could answer them clearly for you. So if you're wondering in your mind, how is the creative response task different to the creative response in literature? Because there are both. In many ways, the students will be using similar skills and both tasks students are working with the text in detail. However, the literature task is focused on how meaning shifts and changes as the form of a text changes and is linked to the adaptations and transformations of the study, area of the study. And the English AAL task is about developing a deeper understanding and analysis of the text by responding to it creatively um, and is linked to the work students are doing in the same area of study by developing analytical responses. One of the things about it is, because um, I've spoken to a few teachers and they say, oh, so I can do The Great Gatsby and then I'll do the, the novel and I'll do The Great Gatsby, the film. No, you won't. That's lit. Okay, that's not what English is about. So remember, English is really about those big issues, those big concepts. Lit is about um, much more about how meaning changes, and I think that's the key. Um, and then the comparative part in um, EAL develops the whole course, uh, over the whole course, whereas in Lit it's only in Unit 2. So I think just to keep, keep that, I don't know how... Um, you'll recognise that there is still an imbalance that literature and English language are still two-hour exams. English is three hours, but they're equivalents. Um, and that's an issue. But 45,000 students sit English. 
7,000 students do lit and about 4,000 do English language. So we still have, it's the, it's the highest stakes subject, it's the most political subject, it's the highest profile, everything that happens around this subject is, is picked up. Um, so it, hence it still has the weight that it does. Um, I don't know how it's going to affect literature because I think it is quite different but it will depend upon the way that it's represented, I suppose, to the students. Um, yeah, but I understand why people think that because we're going to, we're text-based. It makes complete sense. But what the text does is it gives us something concrete to work with, whereas context, we didn't have anything. That would be my answer. Uh, for unit four, the comparison, the comparison writing, yep. so the study design outline given out the word length. Okay. Um, we actually put in sample word lengths in the study design and we put in sample time limits for orals and I think it was 600 to 800 words, okay? Yeah, off the top of my head, I've got lots of things swirling around in it at the minute and I think it's 600 to 800. Can you remember that you don't have to make it bigger than Ben-Hur every time they write? Okay, so we've put 600 to 800 as a reasonable length to be writing in one hour under exam conditions. Some kids will find that really hard and will write 400 words. Some kids will find that really easy and fill two script books. But I say aim, if you've got kids who struggle with literacy, aim for the lowest point and that, you know, aim for 600, then you're doing, you know, you're doing a good job. There's no need, they don't have to be giving you sacks that are 1500 words long. They just need to replicate. Oh, you gave us some idea of the length of the um, explanation decision. Yeah. What about the statement? Of the that's a good point. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I would say I um, ran everything past VCAR before I showed it to you because I don't want to give you the wrong, I don't want to lead you up the wrong path. Um, my answer to that would be that I think the statement of intention would probably need to be a little bit more detailed. However, having said that, I wouldn't expect it to be longer than a page. Um, so, it really, that statement of intention is also there too because you know how sometimes your students who struggle with literacy do really well in the oral so you can actually reward them, but then they've got that written component. So that's there, I guess, giving that, them that reality check because sometimes kids get a bit carried away with you know, I got an A plus for my oral, but you know. So I would say uh, around uh, 250 words, that would be what I'd be looking at. I think that would be, be fair, and I wouldn't expect more than that. Sure, yeah. I know that it doesn't mean yes. yet, but yeah. um, in terms of reading and creating a single text study, yes. um, at the end, so in the exam, are we looking at a response that sort of holistically um, takes in world features, structures, values? That's a good question. I, you know how at the moment we sort of say they're vaguely split between character and theme? Or, you know, they're, or, or there are the, the how questions are the hard ones? <laughs> that they don't do, and <laughs> they do the first one, you know. Um, in answer to your question, yes, they're going to be, there will be two, there'll be two questions, and they will represent two different aspects. So, yes, I would see one as encompassing structures and features, and one as encompassing world of text. I, um, do, I don't know if anyone's read it, because <laughs> clearly I have nothing better to do, but it's, it states, um, Characters, themes, and setting. What do they have to do with each other? So I would suggest one question is going to be about character, theme, or setting, and the other one's going to be about structure. That would be how, and I don't know why they use those three words. I have no idea. But yeah, broad, and then con construction. Yeah. Any other? I think I. Um, EAL again, um, yes. this um, area of study reading and comparing, if there's no comparing it just becomes reading. Yeah. And so the dot points you've got there are focused on ideas, issues and themes, yes. consideration of the ways that teach yes. features. That's just um, on one, that's yes. just on one text. Correct. But it's not like going back to the part one and part two no. kind of ideas. No. I, you know what, I just treat those three in the same way, let's be honest. Yep. 
I don't think you're doing anything more than you would be um, with the other single texts, really. It just happens to fit under that umbrella. You can imagine the logistics of trying to organise that list and how people are going to pick from it. So it'll be interesting to see what it looks like. So I guess the main thing is if you're looking for ideas for 10 and 11, there are a lot of ideas in the book also to help with planning for your 12. So hopefully, hopefully you've been able to um, get a bit of an insight into what it will look like. Yep. Yeah. Well, thanks very much. Oh, I'm only going to take five minutes of your time because I know you're all very eager to get out of here. But um, I did want to say thank you. That was a fantastic overview of the curriculum and I'm sure that for a lot of you it's your first time hearing about the new study, not study design, I've learnt something today too. And, um, you know, that will give you some ideas to take back to your year uh, 10 classes at least and maybe year 11 for next year. So thank you very much. That was great. Um, I do have a little bit of housekeeping. As I said, I'll only take five minutes of your time. Okay, so we do have the three books that are coming out this year. And the first one I wanted to talk about, the image has gone up the top, is this Senior English Skills Builder. This one is often used um, at a year 10 level. What I did want to show you is that you can see um, here that we're actually used the new study as a base, as a frame for students to um, achieve the skills that are required for VCE. So um, if you are looking for something for year 10, um, this might be something that would work for you. All of these books that are advertised up here that you're going to get samples of um, will all be out mid-year, so it'll give you time to assess these. Uh, the next one, Reading Comparing and Reading Creating, is the one that we've spoken about probably predominantly today and the one that Kelly's been involved in writing. Um, this, you know, again, will be quite similar um, as, as a hybrid. It'll be a hybrid text that is quite similar to using language to persuade. So if you've seen using language to persuade, I know a lot of you actually here use using language to persuade. Um, it's going to be a similar format, similar design, colourful and very engaging. Um, so if this is something you like, then the creating and presenting might also be something um, that interests you and the analysing um, and presenting an argument. Again, using language to persuade. So if you have this on your book list, um, then you would be looking at putting analysing and presenting on your book list for next year, at least at the year 10 level. Obviously for year 12, they'll still be reporting to the current curriculum, so you'll carry through with that. It's a book that you would roll over from year 10 or 11 to year 12. So keep it on for your year 12s, but your year 10s, um, and 11s may be looking at, at the new um, edition. So in your packs, you have a flyer that does explain the contents list in the middle and also the prices at the back. So if you are looking at um, any of these, make sure you do contact us. Um, we're happy, our sales reps are happy to come and visit you at any time. Our details are on, on the back here. And um, I just want you to know that you are all getting a sample of every particular book here. They are page proofs, they're not the final product. You will find mistakes in them um, and we will correct those mistakes. So um, feel, feel free to contact us at any time. We're happy to come and visit you. And these books are print only or digital, uh, sorry, print and digital or digital only books. So if your school is a digital school, um, happens that not many senior um, English classes are digital only, but if they are, we have them catered for. So thank you very much, everybody. Drive safe.